I'm saying is simply this. All life is interrelated. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single prominent destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. John Donne placed it in graphic terms. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. He goes on toward the end to say, any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. Therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. The recognition of this is a mastery the dimension of breath. That is a final dimension. Many people never get beyond these first two dimensions. So they seek to live life without a sky. If life is to be complete, I would suggest that the individual must rise up beyond his self-interest, even beyond humanity. Discover the eternal God whose purpose changes not. Now I know that some people have neglected this third dimension for honest intellectual reasons. They have looked out and noticed the problem of evil. They've looked out and noticed that something that the poet Keats calls the giant agony of the world. So they began to ask, if that is a good God, a loving God who is at the same time all-powerful, why does he allow evil of this nature to exist in the universe? Others have noticed the church, an organized religion. They've noticed that the church itself is often stagnant and lax. They've noticed the church itself is off on a tail light as well as a headlight. They've noticed that people in the church all too often have a high blood pressure of creed and an anemia of deeds. From this they have concluded that the church has no relevance to social issues of our day. So because of their disgust with organized religion, they have turned away from the third dimension of life. Then others find it difficult to square their intellectual worldview with the sometimes unscientific and primitive dogmas of religion. And I suspect that most of the people who have neglected this third dimension have done it not for honest, honest intellectual reasons, but because they have become so unconsciously involved in the things of life. So they've ended up living on the plane of secularism and materialism unconsciously. But in spite of our theoretical denials, we continue to have spiritual experiences that cannot be explained in materialistic terms. In spite of our doubts, we continue to feel another order impinging upon us. In spite of our inordinate worship of things, ever and again something comes to remind us. Lasting and eternal things of reality are never seen. So we go out at night and look up at the beautiful stars as they bedeck the heavens like swinging lanterns of eternity and for the moment we feel that we see all then something comes to remind us that we can never see the law of gravitation that holds them there we come into this beautiful chapel we walk around this campus with all of its beautiful buildings and significant architecture and for the moment we think we see all but then something comes to remind us we can never see the mind of the architect who drew the blueprint. We can never see the love and the faith and the hope of the individuals who made these buildings possible. Well, you looked here this morning, and I'm sure you are saying I see Martin Luther King, and I guess I'm saying I see you. I say to you, you only see my body. 
You only see the external manifestation of me. You can never see my mind. You can never see my personality. You can never see the me that makes me me. Everything that we see is a shadow cast by that which we do not see. And so maybe Plato was right. The visible is a shadow cast by the invisible. So even though we can't see God, it is still possible. God is in this universe, so all of our new developments vanish God neither from the microcosmic compass of the atom, nor from the vast unfathomable ranges of interstellar space, living in a universe in which we are forced to measure stellar distance and light years, confronted with the illimitable expanse of the solar system which stars are 500 million million miles from the Earth, in which eight ages of planets are reckoned in terms of billions of years, and heavenly bodies travel at incredible speed. Modern man is forced to cry out with the psalmist of old, and I behold the heavens, the work of thy hands, the moon and the stars, and all that thou hast created. What is man that thou art mindful of him? The son of man that thou rememberest him. So may it not be that St. Augustine was right. We were made for God. We will be restless until we find rest in him. So this dimension gives us a bit of faith in the future. It gives us a sense of cosmic companionship as we struggle to grapple with the problems of life and the problems of the universe. At times people have said that the struggle taking place in the South and the individuals involved in the movement have developed a sort of spiritual movement. I don't think they are talking about religion in the negative sense, but a meaningless religion. But I think it is a spiritual movement in the sense that the participants by and large have faith in the future. And the participants somehow feel that in the struggle for that which is right, in the struggle for justice, that is cosmic companionship. Those students have developed a marvelous little song. It goes something like this, we shall overcome. We shall overcome. Deep in my heart, I do believe. We shall overcome.